it is said that the Buddha's knowledge is limited. That's not how you've heard it, is it? No. But it is. The Buddha's knowledge is limited. It's a new finding. Scientists have just discovered that. The Buddha's knowledge is limited to all there is to know. That is what it's limited to. It doesn't know any more than that. Okay. And all there is to know is also limited. Did you know that? So every day scientists discover something new. But it's going to be limited. It's limited to the Buddha's capacity to know. So no knowledge can ever surface, which is beyond the capacity of a Tathagata. And the Tathagata's knowledge is limited to all there is to know. So ultimately, it's one and the same. For mere mortals like ourselves, who in comparison to Tathagata, if the Tathagata's knowledge and wisdom is like the infinite sky, infinite space, and the vast oceans, unfathomable depth, then our knowledge, our capacity to know is probably it's just the size of a pea. But that's not what impresses me. You know, it's not all the things that he knew that impresses me. Just think for a moment about the great elders. Now, you know, the Buddha's knowledge, his wisdom, his capacity, his skill, you know, these are things that are beyond compare. It's just completely, you know, it's off the scale. There is no hope of us even comprehending, or at least beginning to comprehend, what the size, the, the, the length, the width, the depth of all this is just beyond comprehension. Just take for a moment someone like the great elder Sariputta there. We speak of the great elder Sariputta, we speak of the Mahamoggalla, and we speak of Kashapa, the great. And whenever we speak of them, even if you take Sariputta there, for instance, when we speak of them, when we think of them, it is not how much they knew that comes to our mind, is it? It's not all the things they knew, because to be honest, how much of what they knew do we know? So we are never going to be able to understand or comprehend how much they knew, and therefore that is not what's going to impress us. And truth be told, that is not what impresses me. What impresses me is who they were by character. When we speak of the great elders, when we speak of an arahant, and you hear the word Sariputta, it is not how much he knew that comes to your mind spontaneously. What comes to your mind is what great people they were, their character. Inside who they were, their temperament, the qualities that they possessed. So all they knew and all they got to know, all they realized, all they understood was all for one purpose and that is to render to this world, to give to this world and to offer to this world some of the greatest human beings we've ever seen. So I say this point and I bring this point up because when we come together, we get together, we speak the Dhamma, don't we? We discuss the Dhamma, we learn the Dhamma. You will never be known for how much you knew. Trust me. Einstein was not known for how much he knew. He was known for what he gave to this world. When I say the word Einstein, or oh, when you hear his name, you are reminded of E equals MC squared. They're almost synonymous, aren't they? 
because that is what he gifted the world. He gifted the world uh, this phenomenon of relativity. And today, people use that to live a comfortable life, to help them to progress and advance in science and technology. If you think about Mahatma Gandhi, it is not all the things he knew that impresses you. It is what he gifted to mankind. Because we will never know how much they actually knew. You think you'll ever know how much the Buddha actually knew? When he himself said there are certain things, you must not question the Tathagata. Not because he didn't know, but because it's a pointless question. No matter how much he tries to answer, we are never going to be able to grasp it. So we are never going to know how much they knew. But what we do know, in the ways that we can, from what we've heard from other people, his contemporaries, people who received his blessing, people who were fortunate enough to be around in the time when these great men walked the surface of this earth. They have the stories, they have the testimonies, they have the tales of those good encounters and how their lives transformed as a result. So what do you want to be known for? How much you knew? That is a pointless task. You will not be known for how much you knew. You won't be. You will not be known among your family for how much you know. If you perhaps work in a profession, maybe you're a teacher, but for the rest of those at home, you're not a teacher, you're a mother. So as a teacher, you'll know lots and lots and lots of stuff. If you're a science teacher, you'll know lots of stuff. Maths teacher, you'll know a lot of stuff. But at home, you're just a mother. What good is a mother who knows a lot? but is not motherly. Science teachers will come and go, but a mother is the mother. You can't replace a mother. Because that is who you are. So always define yourself and identify yourself by what you give to this world, not how much you know. As I always say, knowledge is not power. Knowledge put into action is power. And when you put knowledge to action, you become a machine that brings goodness to this world. You become a field on which the seeds of human endeavors yields great crops and it feeds the hungry. Not to feed, not to save their hunger, not the physical hunger, but the hunger that lingers in people's hearts and minds. The hunger that keeps people starving day in, day out. So that is what our purpose should be. Define yourself by who you are to others. It's always good to start a sermon by what you're supposed to say at the end. Huh? Identify yourself by who you are to others, because that is what you will always be known for. Your tombstone will carry a message. It will it'll have an inscription on it. It will never say how much you knew, trust me, it won't. Go find one that says how much this man knew. You are not going to find one that says that. But here's what you'll find. I know not how much, or I care not how much this man knew. I care not how much this man knew or knows because I know how much this man cared. That is what it will say. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how much you know. But I know how much you care. That is how I will always know you. So if you want to be in my good books, if you want to be in God's good books, when judgment day comes, if you want to be judged kindly, then be in his good books. You can never know 
In comparison to God, you can never know as much as he does. Yeah, so he's, he's always going to, if he measures you by how much you know, you know very little. But you'll be glorious. You'll be celebrated by who you have been to others. So all of these endeavors, everything we've come here to do, the Dhamma, practicing of the Dhamma, meditation, whatever, whatever you call it, all of this is for that purpose. To refine and perfect who we are to others and how others benefit from our being. So that is what we are here to do today as well. To improve ourselves, work on ourselves, so that we are always a blessing to others. And others who come and cross our paths are only so glad that they did, are only ever so grateful that they did. So that when you are gone one day and people speak of you, they'll all have to say one story. They'll all, have, they'll all say, oh, how I wish I had another day with this person. Most people, when they die, what they say is, oh, how I wish I had another day to live in this world. Truly, well and truly, the way you should live your life is so that when you're gone, the world will say, oh, how I wish, oh, how we wish that this person, this man, this woman lived another day in this world. So cry not when you leave. So if you have lived a good life, the world will weep your loss. That is the kind of character that we need to try and build within ourselves. And that's why we're here. So how do we do that? Before we do that, let us all take a moment to pay homage to the Omniscient One, He whose knowledge is only limited to what there is to know. Let us pay homage to the Most Compassionate One, He who is the epitome of compassion. Let us pay homage to He who is the fount of wisdom and loving kindness. From Him we learn what loving kindness is, what wisdom is, and the truth is. So, let us bring our palms together in veneration of the Supreme Buddha, our Master, our Teacher, and our Guide on the path to Nibbana. Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa We're all here to set ourselves free. We're all here to set ourselves free from ourselves and no other. This is why this is a very funny business. We learn a lot as we go through in life. how to free ourselves from the adversities that come our way, how to free ourselves from our enemies, don't we? We learn a lot about that. In warfare, they teach you how to fight against the enemy. <clears throat> the president of the country or the king of the state will need to learn how to fend his kingdom from his enemies. So he's always on the lookout. He's always very vigilant, looking out for his enemies. Where are they coming from? When we go to school, we learn. At college, we learn. At university, we learn. Throughout our lives, we learn. Take any book you've ever read. Take any book you've ever studied. And if you turn those pages, you will learn that in those pages will be how to fend yourself 
from threats that come from, come to you from the outside. How to safeguard yourself from your enemies. How to fight enemies of various sizes, man or beast. How to fight disease because they come to you from the outside. How to fight decay because decay can come in the form of the four elements. Fire can cause decay. Water can cause decay. Hmm? Rot can cause decay. The wind can cause decay and the earth can cause decay. How do you fight? How do you fight decay? How do you fight death? It's a big problem. Recently, someone told me that there's this new facility, I think somewhere in Switzerland, where for an amount of money, I think it's cost, cost a fortune, but you can have them freeze your dead body. You can have them freeze your dead body forever. Yeah, I know, you're asking why? Because they're hopeful. People are hopeful that one day science will discover how to bring the dead back to life. So in that hope, they freeze the dead body in these huge chambers. I think it's, uh, they are submerged in some liquid or some gas, some kind of fluid. And close to absolute zero temperatures, they freeze bodies. And you can imagine how much it must cost to run that place. But that's why they choose like countries where it's cooler. So imagine trying to do it in Sri Lanka. So if you want to remain forever in the hope that one day science discovers how to resuscitate you, then towards the end of your life, just make sure you have plenty saved to catch a flight to Switzerland. And once you're there, you'll have to pay a, a few pennies and then they'll put you in this chamber. They'll, they'll take you and show you the whole place, the facility. And I think you have lots of several packages you can choose. It's like and when you go to the funeral parlor, you can select your package. You know that you can do that, right? You can go for the velvet lining or the uh, cloth upholstery. You can choose the flower you want, the lilies or jasmines. Yeah, when you go, you've got to go in style, right? When you come in style, you go in style. Gangnam style. So people want to, you know, so this is, these are the things that people do. You know, they, they want to live forever. You've got to think why people want to live forever. See, in the moment of one's death, why does one wish or own, you know, just if, you see, what is what if, only if I could live for another day. You've got to think why. If you live a full life, if you have lived a full life, and if you do live a full life, as I said at the beginning of this talk, it is the world that will wish that you lived for another day. Remember when the when the Venerable Ananda realized finally that the Buddha is going to give up his life uh, life force, and then in that moment he comes and makes an invitation, but it's too late by then. Yeah, and when the Buddha was uh, on his in his final moments on his deathbed, so to speak. Right, the devas and all, everyone who surrounded him, the great kings, right, everyone, they besieged. Please live on for another day, just one more day, just one day. So that all of, all of mankind, all sentient beings can benefit from the Tathagata. Please live for one more day. But do you think the Buddha wished for that? No, he didn't. 
because he knew his job was done. And that he proclaimed to the Maru. Maru, now my job is done. I have no purpose of being. My being was purely to spread the Dhamma, to set in motion the wheel of Dhamma, and to stand upright the fourfold Sangha community. And now that they are steady, they have practiced the Dharma and the Vinaya, the Tathagata can pass away because there is no role or purpose for the Tathagata any longer. So he didn't want to live another day. So you've got to think then, why is it that people seek solutions through science and technology to want to prolong their lives? Even, the, even <laughs> if the dead got news one day that science was developed enough to bring them back to life, right? then you'll have the walking dead everywhere, I tell you. People will come out of their, what do you call them? Uh, hmm? Their what? Tombs, yes, they'll come out of their tombs, they'll come out of their, their um, burial places. I can't remember the name. Graves, thank you. They'll come out of their graves and they'll start walking around like zombies. Requesting that they are reinstated, put back into life, reintegrated with their families and so on. You know, just like the Pereters do. Because their job here was not done. They, they left this place unfulfilled, unsatisfied, because their job wasn't done. So when a job is left only half done or not done at all, you keep coming back. Now, you know, these people, they have a lot of money. They have a lot of money because they, you know, such a facility, can you imagine how much it must cost you? Because, you know, there's no time frame. One day, whenever that might be, that science is advanced enough to give life back to the dead, right? Whenever that day happens, if that's in 50 years time, then until such time, these bodies will be frozen. If that's in 100 years time, until such time, these bodies will remain frozen. Well, that is, that is what it says in the contract which they sign. Who knows whether they're actually going to be doing that? Nobody knows. But they're willing to give up, they're willing to pay in advance, you know, money that perhaps they could feed the hunger with. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying money that they could have fed the hunger with, money that they could have perhaps put into, you know, finding a treatment for cancer, money that they could have put into maybe building shelter for those who are homeless. Hmm. Let's put the sasana to a side. They, they may not know about the sasana. Right? Money that, could they, that they could have put into for um, reforestation. For conservation of wildlife. I mean, any of these things would have made sense to me. <laughs> I have a pea brain. To me, any of those things would have made sense. But then to pay so that you can one day be reinstated, that you're, you, can, you're, you can be put back to life after you're dead. And these people, you know, they probably not, don't even leave their bodies when they're dead. They're probably still there as a preta, so attached to their existence. But you've got to ask the question, why is it that people want to live another day? If, say, you know, you went to the doctor today, you, had, you, know, you, you coughed out blood, let's say, right? They, took, they rushed you to the doctor, did an examination, and the doctor says, oh, bad news, I'm afraid. It's a, it's a cancer, right? And it's spread throughout the body. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if you'd caught it before, we could have done something, but now all I can give you is maybe three months. Hmm? Just take a moment and imagine this situation for yourselves. If the doctor said you only have three months left. Now, I really want you to try and imagine this because it's, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, I, plenty of time, something like that. It cannot be so. 
if your job isn't done yet, if you feel that you have not achieved what you have come to achieve, if you feel that you have not fulfilled what you have come to fulfill, it cannot be that you will say, yes, I'm content with three months. I don't need any longer. You will always ask for another day. You will. It's not because you're bad. It's not because you haven't understood the Dhamma. It's because you haven't realized the Dhamma. You have understood the Dhamma. But understanding it and realizing it are very different things. When you realize the Dhamma, when you understand the Dhamma, you understand how the Dhamma works. You understand the Four Noble Truths. You understand the Patichasamupada. You understand how this leads to that. But when you realize the Dhamma, when you realize the Dhamma, that is when your problems are solved. Until then, you understand the Dhamma. You understand how things work. But when you realize the Dhamma, you are free. This is an internal, internal transformation. So, anyone who has realized, only one who has realized the Dhamma will. I'm talking about an Arahant, in fact. I'm talking about someone who has completed their transformation. This metamorphosis. They have completed their transformation. An Arahant, in the face of death, is content. Because they have no purpose for further, furthering their existence. They have no reason to live another day. They have no desire to live another day because their job is done. And what is this job that I keep speaking of? The job of trying to achieve happiness. That is what it is. Trying to fulfill themselves. Trying to become content. Trying to... Uh, we, you know this because we often talk about it, right? Why does anyone do anything? It's for one thing. Yes. It's in the name of happiness. It's for the sake of happiness. That's why anyone does anything. Why are we here today? For happiness. If you are not here, where would you be? Wherever. Why would you be there? Happiness again. And for those who are not here today, maybe there was someone you wished or invited to come, but you know they can't for some reason. Wherever they are, they're probably doing something. <clears throat> and they're doing that because that's what makes them happy. At the workplace, you're there because that's what makes you happy. Or in fact, you're trying to be happy. I can't say that's what actually makes you happy, but at least you think that's what's going to make you happy. So in the hope that the next thing you do is always going to make you happy, you just keep on doing things. Non-stop. Time and time and time again, over and over again. Until that one day, you know, you know that this is my last opportunity. This is the last moment. If not now, then never. And then that day comes and you ask yourself, am I done? Am I happy now? Sadly, no. Oh, can I have another, can I have another day? Can I have a few more moments? This is why death is so painful. You know, people think that death is painful because they're going to lose their friends, their families, their material possessions, all the stuff, you know, all the stuff that they've, they've got to their name. That's not really why people grieve and people fear more than grief. People fear death. People fear death because it takes away the hope of achieving happiness. That is what death does, doesn't it? You know, if you have another day, take tomorrow. If you're not happy by the end of today, right, you can go to bed hopeful that when you wake up in the morning, what will you do? You will strive to be happy the following day. No, it's like any day, like when you shut down for the day, you plan all the things that you want to do the following day. Right? Tomorrow, as soon as I wake up, I'm going to go do this, that, and the other. Right? And I'm going to complete this, these jobs, fulfill those tasks, go and meet this person, do that thing, do this thing, and so on. And once I do that, then my, I will feel like my day has, I have accomplished something in my day. So, you know, you go to bed at night, hopeful of the following day. Now, the reason people fear death then is because when death comes, there is not another day. There is no other day. There's no following day. There's no, that hope, you can't keep hope. I mean, it's all right for people at least who believe in life after death. But just think of the poor souls who don't even believe in life after death. How terrible that must be. You know, even if you don't believe in Nibbana, 
for the sake of your sanity, I invite you to at least believe in life after death, because at least that way, when you die, you can be hopeful that when I'll be born again and I can do something <laughs> in my next birth, that will give you some solace. So if, say, if you ever come across someone who doesn't believe in life after death, then tell them at least, you know, you know, just for your sake, believe in life after death, because at least then when you are done, when you die, you can be hopeful that when you wake up again, you can do the, do the undone. Do whatever was left undone. You can do it and you can be happy. This Dhamma is to help you be fearless in the face of death. I'm not talking about fearless about death. I'm talking about having your mind in a state where you don't feel like you need another day. Right now, if you haven't completed your transformation in the Dhamma, you'll feel like you need another day. You need another day. In the next moment, you're going to be happy. This is what hope is. Hope keeps you alive, of course. Hope keeps you alive. Why do people, people feel threatened in the, in the face of threat? You know, if, if, there's a, if someone said, you know, there's a bomb that's going to, about to go off, right? It would be chaos in here. You'd all run out of the way. And I'm not saying don't. Do. <laughs> it's okay. But running out of fear is one thing. But running with fear is another. I'm talking about that fear. You can run out of this place to not save yourself, but to save others, you can run out of this place. Saving others. If your presence is a presence for others, then getting yourself out of fear, if there's going to be a bomb that's going to go off outside, you, know, you need to do that. But if you do it out of fear, then you've got to ask and question yourself, why is it that fear comes to me when I think about death? Then most of you are, you know, still in your youth. And most of you, I mean, when I say youth, any, any, anything this side of 90, hmm? you're all in your youth. Happy now? <laughs> right, so I, I think for us, forever I'll be doing these sermons, everyone will be in the youth. I don't expect anyone over 90 to come. <laughs> okay, say so 100, right, just to be on the safe side. Anyone this side of 100 is in their youth. So it's almost impossible for you to imagine what it must be like when those last moments come. It's, it's really impossible. You can try to think, but you're not going to experience the same thing. It's that fear that comes, you know, when, when you know that it's, your fate has now been sealed. The doctor has said it's only so much time you have left. Fear really takes over. That's why any saving of yourself has to be done before that fear strikes you, because once fear strikes, right? once fear strikes, your mind is not at peace. When your mind is not at peace, your mind will not be able to understand the Dhamma. Because peace, or that, that's, that, that mentality of peace, that mentality of coolness, right? you need that, for the Dhamma to take root. Otherwise, it's a bit like, imagine if you planted something in the ground and then every day to see whether it has taken root, you dig, you dig it up again and take, take the seed up and, just, and you check whether the roots, whether it has started rooting. And then you put it back in, no, not rooted yet, put the soil back in and you come back the following day and you do the same thing again. When is it going to root? It's never going to root. This is similar to when the mind is in fear. So when fear takes over, it's very difficult. That's why most people don't understand the Dhamma. Because when do they usually come to the temple? Chanda dosa bayamoha, that's when they come to the temple. <laughs> Either when they're in terrible fear, right? Or when they have gone through a deep loss and they're grieving, then they come running to the temple. 
in the hope that they can understand the Dhamma. But the, the Dhamma cannot be fed then. Because the mind is locked down. You can't. And even more. Right? When you are delusional. Just take a moment to think about why at the monastery, no matter what you offer, right, we never put a name on it. Right? We, never, we never praise you individually. We praise our devotees uh, you know, collectively, but never individually. That is because if you praise someone individually and they have moha or delusion within them, then that ignites a sense of pride. And your ego starts to take over. When that happens, again, you are back to moha. Shuts down. The Dhamma can no longer seek within. It doesn't seep in then. After that, Chanda dosa by moha, all these four. Chanda is when you have a deep desire for something. You really want something, right? right? When the Buddha wanted to give Prince Nanda the Dhamma, that was not the moment because he was so deeply attached to his fiancée, the woman he was going to get married to. Yeah, that was a deep sense of attachment, desire, chanda. So what did the Buddha have to do? He said, come on, chanda, uh, not chanda, come on, nanda. And he left his arms bow for the prince to follow him, right? And even after he had gone with him to the, to the monastery, he still kept on talking about her. And at that point, the Buddha performed a miracle. It is said that the Buddha held this young man by his hand and took him up into the heavens. Mm. He took him up into the heavens to give a display of what he was missing out on, <laughs> of what could have been, if he just let go of his desire for this mere woman, right? This this human woman, then this is this is all you can have. See, at that point, Nanda's deep desire that had rooted and entirely, you know, completely consumed his heart and his mind. And he was able to let go of that because he saw something better, something greater, something bigger, something more pleasurable, and therefore he let go of that. But he wasn't focused on one thing. So he said, you know, you can have all of this, all of this. Yes. But where Janapada Kalyani was concerned, you know, he was so focused on this one woman, he couldn't let go of her. So there would have there would not have been a point in the Buddha preaching the Dhamma to him because Desire had consumed him. Now, I'm relating this story to you because I want you to spot and catch yourself where you fall victim. Where you feel too desirous about something. If there's something you really and strongly desire, in those moments, right, no matter, even, even if the Buddha were to come here and preach to you, you, your mind would still be shut. You will not absorb it. Because these are barriers to your understanding of the Dhamma. Chanda is one of them. There's also another type of Chanda, that Chanda is the Chanda for Nibbana. Yeah, your desire to attain Nibbana, that is a different type of Chanda. This Chanda is Chanda for sensual things, worldly things, worldly desires. So identify whether you have them in mind. You know, when you bring yourselves here every Saturday, every Sunday, you know, whenever you come to the monastery, right? That's why Guru Hamdra always says, you know, leave your worldly life behind as you walk in through these gates, right? Because if you bring in here all those things that you design, you're thinking about your children, you're thinking about your car, you're thinking about your dog, you're thinking about your job, right? While you're here, if that is what you're contemplating on, if that has, if that's consuming you while you're here, it's virtually impossible for this Dhamma to take, to take root in your mind. You know, once you leave, you can, of course, you know, pick it all up. Start thinking about it once you leave, but while you're here, be here. So it's very important.
to identify that. So check within yourselves. Is there, are, there, are there certain things which I'm deeply attached to? Now, don't take this the wrong way, right? No, you bring your children with you. And I want you to do that. It's good. But once you brought your child and you walked them through these doors and you sat them down, at that moment, you need to let go of the idea that this is my child. And whatever happens, happens. Because if you're here as a mother, then you're not here as a disciple. You can't be both at once. Again, Chandra. My child, is he okay? My child, is she okay? Is she listening to the Dhamma? Is she sleeping? Hmm? Is she okay? See? <laughs> now, how can you listen to the Dhamma? You can't listen to the Dhamma. Even if you heard the words, those words are not going to have an impact on you because you're shut. It's like turning a pot upside down and trying to fill it. It doesn't work. So, as I said, don't take it the wrong way. That's not now saying leave your children at home when you come here. Bring your children. But that is your duty, bringing them here. Getting them to listen to the Dhamma is not your duty. But if they start to make a noise, then you've got to take them out. But if they're here, if they're patient, if they're listening to the teaching, then you need to come out of your motherhood or your fatherhood in that moment and then just become a disciple. I'm here for my salvation. You need to get into that mood. And the same goes to everyone. Right? So, so there will be among you, uh, you know, whatever profession you're in, right? Maybe you've come here and you see perhaps, you know, someone who you work with, your colleague, right? Maybe you're the boss, he's your employee, your subordinate, right? Whilst you're there, you bring him here. But after he's here, you let go. While you're here, you're not his boss. And they, if, you, if you continue to keep in your mind that this is, he is, I'm his boss, I've got to look after him, you know, is he okay and all that, the Dhamma is not going to do what he can to you. You need to let go of that. If you come here with your spouse, now I see sometimes, you know, you, people sit on one side of the room, the other person sits on the other side of the room. I think that's very intelligent. It's quite wise, very wise to do that. Again, I'm not saying that you should. Okay, I'm just saying, even if you can, you know, get them to get on your lap and you can still forget them, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> it's not where they sit that matters. It's where you have them sit in here that matters. If your thoughts are always with them, hmm? if, you, if to listen to the sermon you come here holding hands, but also listen to the sermon you're still holding hands, you can't let go, then Chanda is going to take, get the, take the better of you and you're not going to be able to understand the Dhamma. So that's why as a disciple, when you're sat down to listen to the teaching, that's it. That's why Guru Swami Nasa always says, you and I alone. That's it, nobody else. Disconnect yourself from everything else. And you can do that. Yes, of course, you know, that doesn't disconnect you entirely, like completely. And you're after the end of the sermon, you know, you are still, you're still the mother, you're still the father, you're still the husband or the wife. That's, that's fine. And, you, you know, deep down inside, your subconscious knows this. But you can bring yourself to that mindset that you are now a disciple. It's like when you have, you know, when you're with your husband, you are a wife, aren't you? At that moment, you don't feel like you're a mother. When you're with your child, you are a mother. You can, you can get into that persona. You can identify yourself with that personality. So in the same way, when you're here, I am a disciple of the Buddha. That's what I'm here for. You become one with the teaching. So there's nobody else, no one else. So all the Dhamma we talk about, you think this is all given to me. So then that, uh, the, that application happens right here and right now. So, you know, from time to time, things will come to your mind about, oh, I forgot to do that, I forgot to do this, what about the shopping? Should I do that later on today, before I get home? Right? Am I going to go to this place or that place? When those thoughts come to mind, do try and park them. Don't get on that train. Because if you get on that train, you never know where you're going to get off. But you will miss this station. If you're here, be here. 
So I'm talking about how you free yourself from the, the, the clutches of chanda for the duration that you're here. So while you're here, you're not a mother. You know, try, try to at least come to this, this thinking, right? While you're here, you're not a mother. You're not a father. You're not a husband or a wife. You're not an anagarika or an anagarika. If you are, I'm, not, I'm not the senior anagarika. I'm not, I'm not anyone like that. If you are listening to this as a monk, you know, in that moment, you are not a monk physically, but you are, we are all monks mentally. We are all bhikkhus. Hmm? And what is, a, what is a bhikkhu? A bhikkhu is one who wishes to free themselves from suffering. Free themselves from becoming. That is what a bhikkhu is. So we are all here as bhikkhus, as upasakas and upasikas. Bhikkhu bhikkhuni. This is the fourfold community. So if you are here as one of them, now you will understand the Dhamma. But if you are here as a mother, a mother upasika, <laughs> And as long as, and until you get out of that mother seat. Otherwise you'll think, ah, oh, good, you know, Swami Nuhas is giving us some sermons, you know, yes, this is going to help me deal with the problems I have at home with my son. Because you're still a mother. Right? And when I bring my child here, I want Swami Nuhas to say, say something so that he will change. I know. <laughs> Or you bring your husband with you, maybe, you know, he's, he's a drunk all the time. He always drinks, so you bring your wife, husband with you. I want Swami Nasa to give us a sermon today so that he stops drinking. <laughs> See, in that moment, you're still a wife. So these words will just fall on deaf ears. So that's chanda. And similarly, you have dosa. Anger. On one hand, you had affection, and this now you have affliction. Anger, animosity. Hmm? That's why in sermons we say, do try and keep any noise to a, to a minimum. Because you say, you know, if say a phone rings. Now, if a phone rings here, yeah, it's fine, okay? I'm just saying, if a phone rings or an alarm goes off, right? Or some, you know, something drops and you know someone makes a noise, even a cough. Right? It's not your fault because you're not intentionally doing it. But if there's someone in the room who gets angry because of that, in those in that moment they go from an equanimous state of mind to dosa. In that moment. And if they continue to linger in that state of mind for the next hour, for the next one and a half hours, and they continue to these people, why can't they just leave these kids at home? You know, the moment they come here, they're just screaming and shouting and running around, making noises. Hmm? Why, why can't they leave their phones at home? Right? If they bring it here, why can't they put it on silent? How many times must we keep telling them? Right? So the Swami knows he has no problem. He's continuing the sermon. But some, someone in the room, He's thinking about that. See, here's what they're thinking. If the, if the phone didn't, went off, didn't go off, right, we would have been able to listen to the sermon, but it was a distraction to the sermon. Now, the sermon's continuing. So where's the distraction coming from now? Not the phone. <laughs> it's not coming from the phone now. That was only for a moment. But when Dosa takes over, anger takes over, then the barrier goes up again. Why? Because you, you lose this prasada chitta. Without that, the Dhamma cannot do what it's supposed to do. It is part of the environment in which the seed of Dhamma takes root. You need that. You need that joy. That, that joyfulness that you experience. I don't mean physical joy, right? but just a, just a joyful state of mind that is required for the Dhamma to do its job. It's like, you know, before you paint, you use a primer, right? And so that the paint sticks. In the same way, when you, want to, when you want to understand the Dhamma, you need to have a joyful state of mind. Not like joy, jumping up joy. No, you don't need that much joy. You just, just be joyful. 
essentially what we are saying is you shouldn't be in one of those four states chanda dosa bhaya and moha so you need to try and be here and when dosa takes over that when you start to feel that anger that animosity that maybe it can even go as far as you know frustration right then in those moments the dhamma cannot do its job as i said it's like turning a pot upside down and trying to fill it with water it's never going to fill then of course you have by which is fear fear of something it could even be the fear of am i going to understand this sermon that is also fear right say the sermons go on going and the, the dhamma is just keep it just keeps on flowing but you begin to think this is this is a bit deep am i going to understand this um, have i got enough merits to understand this and you then you start to become fearful even that will now start blocking you because that again is a hindrance it's an obstacle i'm sh- sharing this with you so that you can be mindful about this so that when these emotions take over if you remember from today's talk then you identify ah i see what i'm doing now you know anger has taken over desire has taken over fear has taken over ego has taken over usually they prevail in the mind when you are not aware of them Hmm? when then when you're not aware of them these emotions they they consume you they 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 can overwhelm you but when you identify desire as desire that is the beginning of the end of desire when you identify anger as anger that is the beginning of the end of anger just take a moment you know think about a time when you've been really angry when you're really angry you can be in one of two states of mind one is you're focusing on what it is that has made you angry yeah when you're angry one state of mind is your focus is on what it is that has made you angry so your focus is outside so then you're trying to find solutions to that problem if they've told if someone said something you didn't like now you need to try and fix that right tell them off ask them why they said that So now your focus is on the object that you believe is the source of your anger. But you can be in another state of mind when you're angry. Turn it back around on yourself. Why am I angry? Not what made me angry, but why am I angry? Where is that anger coming from? You still sense anger, but you are now beginning to focus on the source of anger, not out there but in here. when that happens folks you realize ah this is anger you begin to understand anger as anger see in the arya vinaya if you want to deal with anything there are four things you need to understand about it first you need to realize anger as anger then you got to realize the cause of anger then you got to realize the cessation of anger and then ultimately the path the cessation of anger if your focus is on the outside world object as the source of your anger now the four the same four applies right say this gentleman is making me angry that is anger what is the source of anger this man and the cessation of anger get rid of this man and the path to cessation of this anger yes either i want you out of here or get someone you know ask call the security get this man out see part of cessation of anger this is you know the four truths sometimes they are ignoble the other times they are noble when your focus is on the outside world and trying to find solutions out there these are the ignoble truths they you know they are truths it's what you learn at science and math and say school but when you focus when your focus is back on the self and how this suffering comes from within now that is noble it's noble because you know noble is a loose translation of arya yeah so noble because once you apply that knowledge you are able to fix that problem once and for all
If Rhea is a vehicle, then Arya is stopping that vehicle. Stopping, the, stopping it at its root. Stopping, it, stopping the real causes of the problem. Undoing it at, at the real causes of the problem. So, it depends on where your focus is. So whenever you're in that state, right, come to your senses that this is anger, and that's where you have to start. I often, you know, when I speak with uh, young Swami Nahansas and so on, you know, I always tell them, whenever you feel desire, anger, ego, right, whatever, you know, whatever shape, whatever ways in which defilements manifest themselves within your mind, the first thing to do is not to feel like, not to feel, you know, um, disappointed. Disappoint, there's no room for disappointment in the Sambhu Dasasana. It, it's not a time, there's no room for regret in the Sambhu Sasana. It's not for you to think I'm a bad person, I'm a terrible person. See, I'm, I have desire in my mind. Right? I see someone, I really like them. How can I as a monk? But I can't help it. Look at it, you know, how disgraceful. I don't like someone, I don't like what they're saying, I don't like what they're doing. How disgraceful, I feel anger towards them. Right? And then you start to attack yourself. Is that not again Chanda Dosa by Manmoha? It's counterintuitive. So try to attack yourself. You know, these are the three. Two of these are worldly. One is out of this world. Right? These two are mundane. You know the Sudhu Minister, right? Then there's the Kalu Minister. Right? And then there's the Arya Minister. Right? These people. I can't use the, <laughs> the English term. It has a very different connotation. I can't say, I can't say white men and black men. <laughs> They're killers. <laughs> I'm talking about Sudhu Minister. And I'm talking about Kalu Minister. Right? So, you know, they, they, they try to fix the problem outside. They think that all evilness is out there, not within me. All terrible things happen outside, not within me. Right? I am not the one who's responsible for my happiness, it's these people. Or rather, I'm not the one who's responsible for my suffering, it's these people, so I need to go and sort them out. This man is making me angry, I need to sort him out. See, this is Kalu, black. It does not lead to anything good, that's why black. It doesn't lead to anything good. But here's what happens after you start listening to the Dhamma. At least, you know, the first steps. You start taking, you know, your initial steps on the path. You go from Kalu Minister to Sudhu Minister. What you do then is, still not the right thing. Now you're doing, you're saying, it's not his fault, it's my fault. I am the bad person. You see, they're, they're all right. You don't have to put up with them. It's fine. I, I'm the one who can't tolerate them. It's my fault. Right? So bad things happen around you and sometimes people are actually bad, but you think, you know, you know it's my fault. I have to be able to be good. I have to be able to, to bear it. I have to be able to tolerate it. Right? So again, now when something, something happens to you, you feel, as I said, anger, right? you, you beat yourself up about it. And you think that is virtuous, beating yourself up about something. I'm a terrible person. Look at all the bad things I've done. Especially when you retrospectively look at the things you've done in your past, right, when you talk about this Vasalagati and so on, right, and we reflect on the things you've done in the past, right, terrible things that might have happened in your past, things that today you regret. Regret is an attribute of this, this second type of people. They regret. But when you do the bad deed, you don't regret. That's how you do it. So actually, worldly people, they keep jumping. They keep saddling both these horses. On one, at one point on the, on the black, black horse, the other time the white horse. So this, this is where most people live. Either doing the bad deed or regretting the bad deed. Hmm? Because how does regret work? Regret works when in this present moment, so take, this is, uh, this is the past. This is the, oh, let's put it that way. That is the past, this is the present, and this is the future. Okay? Say you got angry. You, you go home from work, right? And your kid hasn't done the homework. And they have to, now you have to sit down with them and do their homework with them. And it's 
quite late and they have to do their homework by the following day. So now you're angry because they haven't done their work. Okay. So this is, this is when it happened. Now you're angry there. In that moment, you're angry. Okay. Then, so you're angry, but you still did the homework. And then you sat down and you thought, before I go to sleep, I have listened to one of Guru Hanru's sermons. So you plug your headphones and now you're in bed until you fall asleep, you're listening to the sermons. <laughs> so as you start listening to the sermons, now this is, that was the past and now you're coming into the present. Okay. So this was angry, told them off, shouted, hit them, punishment, uh, started doing the homework, right? And uh, then shouted a little bit more and said, then this is why I tell you to do your homework. See, now I'm so late and uh, then more punishment, right? But homework, 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 homework. Right? And then, uh, so around here, you started getting ready for bed, right? And then now you're here. Listen to the sermon now. Right? As you start listening to the sermon, now Guru Hamza is saying, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, he's mocking you and ridiculing you and insulting you. Right, for, for being angry with your children. Right? And so in this moment you begin to understand, realize, oh, I shouldn't have been angry. This anger is such a terrible thing, you know. How oh, did I get the better of me? How could I? I shouldn't have. Right? Now you start to regret. And here's why you start to regret. In this moment, in this chitta, remember we talked about not chit not self-conscious, but chitta conscious. Yeah. So in this chitta. You're now listening to the Dhamma sermon. And in that Dhamma sermon, whatever is delivered in that moment is what you bear in this moment. Right? That is what Dhamma is, what the mind bears. Okay? So what the mind bears now is the truth. You're listening to the Dhamma. And the Dhamma says it's terrible to get angry. That is what you bear. But you can't help yourself from feeling this sense of self. And because you sense a sense of self, who's listening to the sermon? I'm listening to the sermon. And the sermon says that it's bad to be angry and it's good to be kind and, and benevolent and be patient, right? And all these good things. So, but who, who's listening to all this? You are listening to all of this. You want that to be you. You want you to be like that. You want to be the. You want to be able to assimilate the Dhamma and be like what Guru Hamdu wants you to be. So in that moment, you are in fact a good person, because that is what the mind bears at that moment, right? In that moment, you know, like when you when you are with your child, you feel motherly. When you are with your spouse, you feel wifely. <laughs> In whatever moment you are, right, you are you in that moment. Okay, whatever takes over your mind, whatever, whatever emotions arise in your mind in that moment, that is what you are. So these thoughts in that moment define who you are. But the problem is this, while that's happening there, you're continuing to feel this sense of self. And then what happens is, because you sense a sense of self, this sense of self has, because of, this is jati, Okay, it's not a self, but a sense of self. This is jati. The nature of jati is this nature of existence. It gives you this impression of existence. And if you exist now, then where, when else did you exist? In the past. Okay? So if you existed in the past, then your mind is now cast back. Through memory, you remember that you were angry two hours ago. You are angry two hours ago. So who was angry two hours ago? I was angry two hours ago. I'm not angry now, but the Dhamma sermon says that being angry is such a terrible thing. It's a vice, not a virtue. And therefore now you feel terrible that you were angry. You feel bad about it. Now here's where regret comes. But regret again is one of the four obstacles, chanda, josa, baya, moha. Because regret is actually a bit of dosa, right? And some moha. <laughs> So here's what happens at that point then. For as long as you feel that it was you who did that and you regret those choices, you can continue to listen to the Dhamma. But this is all the Dhamma will do to you. It will keep on telling you that you are a bad person. 
it will keep on making you feel that you were a terrible person that you should have known better you should have done better here's what will not happen for you you will not realize the dhamma you will not realize the four no- the four noble truths because to get to nobleness you need to come out of this self based thinking but for as long as you regret what you've done in the past you continue to embody the past actions and the future actions and so on so you will you cannot it's impossible for you to understand the dhamma in those moments because the mind is shut because you regret you're regretting what you've done in the past but if you can come out of that thinking if you can come out of that this regretful thinking now you begin to understand that well actually guru hanuman was talking about anger not my anger he was talking about anger how do you see the ang- how do you see anger anger doesn't belong to anyone just like this pen doesn't belong to anyone why did god create the pen not to own yeah absolutely to write but not to own right so anger is is the same it's an emotion it's an emotion that appeared in the mind but when you sense the self right now you're thinking that is my anger who was angry yesterday i was angry yesterday who had this sense of lust yesterday i had this sense of lust yesterday now let's just take for a second i say um i'm trying to give you a civil example <laughs> something that is an offend or upset anyone um ah okay let's say let's just say uh okay let's just say you are listening to a sermon right and you you like that voice it's it's so you, you it's it sounds really nice to you you're enchanted by that voice i use that example very freely because i clearly you're not <laughs> enchanted by this voice <coughs> who's coughing and clearing my throat so i so, so no fear no risk there okay so let's just say you really like that voice and you're you're really grasped by that voice right and you you really like listening to that voice but later down the line you realize oh that's terrible i shouldn't be feeling like this about the silmani and mohanse or about the swami and mohanse how how you know how is it that i feel in this way about someone who's delivering the dhamma to me that's not good that's not nice i shouldn't be feeling this way right so now again if if and when you feel that have that have those thoughts of desire right towards whatever object later on so that was an experience of not a sad face but a smiley face because you liked it but later down the line right you realize oh i shouldn't have felt that way hmm? i shouldn't have felt that way about that person about this about the silmani and mohanse right yes she spoke to us in a very soft voice but how dare how 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 terrible of me to actually think of you know what a sweet voice was that was not the purpose of my being there i should have just listened to the dhamma and now you start to beat yourself up again in those words are the wisdom that you need to free yourself from suffering but what you what you're doing then is focusing on how you felt in the past you're focusing on your desire not desire but if you can come to your senses and realize that it was just desire that arose in the mind a couple of hours ago now you're starting to see desire as a series of causes leading to an effect you're beginning to see the conditional nature of desire you're beginning to see the conditional nature of aversion you're can you're beginning to see the conditional nature of lust and anger because after all what is the dhamma here to do to help you understand the dependent origination of everything the conditional nature of everything i often use this example you know a man sat under a coconut tree right ah oh, how convenient here's a coconut imagine there's a guy sat down here right 
and a coconut falls from the tree. Okay? But this is a very peculiar kind of coconut tree. The moment you look up, the coconut vanishes. And this is a hypothetical example, right? I'm trying to explain to you that the reason you suffer through your problems is because you don't see the problem. When you look up, you see that it's a coconut. Actually, you're looking up to see the coconut. Someone says, hey, look, there's a coconut up on your, uh, up, you know, just above you. Get out. So you go, where? And you look up. The moment you look up, this coconut vanishes. Then you say, no, there's no coconut. And you look back down. And the coconut appears again. And it's falling. It's falling and it's going to fall on your head and crack your skull. But it won't do that for as long as you see the coconut. <laughs> In the same way, all these defilements, you know, desire, whatever manifestation of it, anger, hatred, jealousy, right? All these things, they appear in your mind only until you see them as a conditional entity. Because, like, I, like I've always told you folks, right? ignorance is the ignorance of ignorance. That is what ignorance is. Ignorance is the ignorance of ignorance. Once you understand what ignorance is, you're no longer ignorant. It's an autological phrase. It means it's, it's what it is. The word describes, the, the word is what it is. Uh, and ignorance is the best example of that. Ignorance is ignorance of ignorance. Yeah, so... In this moment, like you're listening to the sermon and you're, you're, you think, oh, you know, I like that, that man in Rohanse's voice, or I like the way she looks, whatever, right? And you're, you're contemplating on that, but then you think, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. How terrible of me. I'm evil. I'm, I'm, I'm unvirtuous. You know, how, how immoral of me. And you can keep telling your off about it. You're completely shutting yourself off from the Dhamma. Because now you're in regret mode. That is dosa. Now the Dhamma can't help you. So that's why I always tell my students, don't linger in the defilements that come into your mind from time to time. Just let it be. Let it be. You know, it's like, say you wanted to walk on a, on a road and to get somewhere. Along the way, there are big stones, rocks. Okay? To walk this path, you have to move the rocks out of the way. What some people do is, when they come across one of these rocks, they pick it up and they put it over their heads. They carry it on their shoulders or put it on their head. And then they continue until they come across the next one. Then what do they do? They pick that up as well and put it on their head. So every time they come across a rock, each of those rocks, they just keep putting on their heads, each one, Weighing them down. Each one making this journey even more difficult. That is what, not what you're supposed to do. Just move them out of the way. Not put it on your head. See if you are that kind of person. When we speak of defilements, right? when you speak about Raga or Dvesha or Moha and each of, the man or each of their manifestations, right? let's say, say, you know, one of you or you know some among you or whoever right you feel you feel egotistical about something you feel pride about something and maybe you feel i understand the dumb better than any of these people in this room it's okay if you feel that way it's all right that is why you have to be here you know <laughs> why does one go to the hospital because they're sick should you feel embarrassed that you're sick if you're in a hospital should you? No. You know, the guy next to you, he's got a splitting headache. Maybe he's got, a, he's, he's got diarrhea. But, you know, you've got maybe a, you know, something wrong with your lungs. That's okay. You know, we're all here as patients. And as long as there's medicine, as long as there are doctors and nurses right, who are there to look after us and heal us and give us the right treatment and love and, you know, loving care, right, then what's the matter? What's the problem? 
So one of the things I, I, I will I'll tell you today, and I'll keep on saying, right, whatever defilements you have in your mind, right, first of all, learn to be okay with that. I don't want you to misunderstand me. What I'm not saying is, then live with it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, come to terms with it. Imagine if you were entangled in some rope, right? You were your whole body, then someone tied you up in ropes, right? To free yourself up, there's no point just jumping around, right? And you're pulling and tugging. There's no point doing that. What you've got to do is first stop, relax, observe. Because if you get too flustered, right? And if you get if you get too, too agitated about it, then you're not, you're not in a state of mind that is free to relieve yourself from that problem. You are consumed by the problem. That is the worst thing you can do to yourselves. And I speak to you about this because you are good people. You're all good people. You're very good people. You're too good. <laughs> That's the problem with you lot. <laughs> you're too good. You're so good that when bad comes into your mind, right? It's like when you see a cockroach <laughs> jumping around. And what does that, what does it, what does the thing do? It just it goes all over you. Right? Or see if, if a little spider gets on your body. And if you're scared of spiders, right? No point jumping around. Because the spider is going to get even more scared. And then it's just going to go and try and find somewhere to hide in, in your clothes or somewhere. But if you just relax, right, where's the spider? Hold on, where is it? Ah, oh, there you are. Right. Yes, yeah, spidey. Right. <laughs> and put it to the side. You mustn't get agitated. Relax. You know, if, I, if I'm asking you to be okay with your defilements, then you should be okay, shouldn't you? Yeah. Swami Nuhaz is asking you to be okay with your defilements. First, be okay with that. Right? If, if, you know, don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel like I'm, I'm a terrible person. Nobody else, you know, they must all be holy. I'm just, I'm, I'm the only one who's, who's, who's bad and terrible. No, it's not so. Any other hands in the room? Anyone? See, none of them are. <laughs> okay, so they all got desire, they've all got aversion, and they've all got delusion. That's why we're all here. He is the only Arahant in the room, nobody else. So it's okay. But here's what happens when you start to regret. And when you start beating yourself up about something. Chanda dosa by moha. And moha, again, is you know, it's terrible. It's when you compare yourself. Right? Say you're part of the Anagarika program. Right? All the other Anagarikas, they're sat down in meditative posts like this. Right? For, it's been three hours now and they haven't battered an eyelid. You're the newbie. <laughs> you come into the valley, Malheur. You also try and sit, like, sit down like this, you know, with your arms, you know, back straight and your arms like this. And then you start. Three minutes into your meditation. <laughs> huh? you, you just lift in a half, half an eyelid to see what's going on. <laughs> and you realize all the Anagarika Mahatyas, you know, they sat down like this. No one, you, know, you wonder whether they're even breathing. <laughs> Maybe they're absorbed in their jhanas. Uh, but you're just like, you're, you know, you're, you're scratching yourself, you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, you feel like you want to go to the toilet, right? And you wonder, nobody else wants to. Will I ever be able to do this? So you begin to, you begin to doubt yourself. Doubt again is moha. These are all, you know, these are the perfect traps. Remember, you're trying to get out of yourself, folks. Try and understand this. You're trying to get out of yourself. So therefore, the self will throw up everything it can to be with you. You're trying to remove this, this sense of self that you've always known. So when you try to remove that, right, and free yourself from yourself, it will, it will try every trick in the book. Even once you feel, you know, these are these, this is how I should feel. Guilt is a good, it's a good feeling because I'm I'm only thinking that I'm I'm a good person. 
right? But good is the greatest hindrance to greatness. It's the biggest hindrance. When you feel you're good, that's the biggest hindrance to greatness. So, catch yourself out when you feel this way. I'm sharing this with you so that you can be mindful now, you know, in your, in your dealings. Not with anybody, but with yourself. You won't read this stuff in books, I tell you. Because this you experience. I'm sharing with you my personal experience. Very difficult to catch these things in books. You know, when we feel that we are better than someone, yes, we feel that it's, it's not right. But what about when you feel, when you've caught that, I feel I'm better than, I'm, I'm, I'm better than someone. And then you think I'm bad to think like that. So I'm not better than someone. I'm actually worse than everybody else. It's a killer. It's a silent killer. You don't know it when it comes, but it's there. And that becomes a hindrance. So catch it when it comes. So that's why I say one of the best things you can do is just be okay with your defilements. You know, one of these days when you feel like, you know, you have, you, when you've got some time, just write down what some of the defilements you have, are, right? I, I feel this way. I feel that way about this person. I feel, I feel this way about that person. I don't like this person at all. I, I really like this person very much, right? Uh, and you write, I like to eat carrots. I don't like to eat beans. I like my broccoli. I don't like my cucumbers, right? No, write it all down, right? And once you've written it all down, just put it on the side and go, that's all right. It's okay. So yeah, you've written all these things that you, your likes and your dislikes, right? It's, Okay. It's okay. I'm okay with that. Because you being okay or you being not okay has nothing to do with cleansing your mind of these defilements. Causes lead to results. If you're in the right environment where you're, where you're listening to the Dhamma, where you're hearing the Dhamma, let's not say listening to the Dhamma, you're hearing the Dhamma. The Dhamma is being said, being preached, and you hear it. And all you got to do is keep yourself awake, be here, listen to the Dhamma, and the Dhamma will do its magic. It's not you who needs to understand the Dhamma. Let the, un let the Dhamma be understood. It's not your job to understand the Dhamma even. <laughs> let the Dhamma be understood. So what if it is not understood? Yes, exactly. It's okay. Well, say one of these sermons, you know, you found it's very profound. It's too deep. I didn't get any of that. Oh, I didn't get enough. And all the other people in the room, they're going, yes, yes, Swami Nasa, I got that, got that, got that. Yes, Swami Nasa. I understood that, Swami Nasa. And you're like, can't even understand a word of what he's saying. <laughs> you know, as you leave this room, at least, maybe we put a board up here saying, it's okay. <laughs> if you haven't understood the Dhamma, it's okay. All you've got to do is bring yourself back in here again on the following day. You know, I'll tell you this, right? None of them understood the Dhamma. And I'm talking, say, you're, imagine you're the one who, has, who doesn't understand the Dhamma, right? You're that one. You know, we are all someone, right? So I am the one who doesn't understand the Dhamma. <laughs> well, that's your identity, right? The one who doesn't understand the Dhamma, like the blessed one, the unvanquished one, huh? the perfect one. There's also one who doesn't understand the Dhamma. Right? Let's just say that is you. Right? Here's what I have to say. All these people, they didn't understand the Dhamma in the Buddha Kashyapa's time. See? It's okay. None of them understood the Dhamma in the Buddha Konagaman's time. Right? It's alright. It's okay. And how do you know whether someone who's nodding their head frantically actually understood the Dhamma? Maybe they've got a problem with their neck, just going like this. Just learn, learn to be okay with yourselves, first of all. It's like when you try to unzip something, you know. If you, if you fret too much, you can't do it. You've got to do it slowly. If you try to untie a shoelace, right, if you, you know, really... Uh, 
fret about it, you can't do it. You just got to do it slowly. Got to do it just gracefully. Remember, this is not difficult. It is subtle. I always keep telling you this. It's not difficult. And you're all good people. That's why I'm talking to you about this stuff. <clears throat> like I said, there are no devotees to do sermons to anymore. <laughs> all the Angarikas, Anagarikas, Sravikas, Sravikas, and Vaisis and so on. <laughs> No more devotees to do sermons to. So that's why I say you're all good people. There are no bad people among you. You're all people who feel bad about some of the things you've done in the past. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. You know, you're all going through that regret mode. And that, you know, there's a face. That face where you're, you're, you're the bad guy. Then that face where you're the good guy. And the good guy regrets all the things that, that you did as a bad guy. Right? You know, maybe, may, maybe, right? I'm just saying maybe, perhaps, you know, maybe you had extramarital affairs huh? five years ago. Nobody knows about this until now. Maybe you had a wife and another wife. It's all right. We don't tell anyone. Maybe you cheated in the exam. Maybe that's how you got that promotion. It's okay. You learn to be okay with it. See, we are all okay. It's about time you learn to be okay with yourself. You can't do this holding your breath. You need to breathe first. So stop beating yourselves up if you are. Maybe you cheated on, on, your, on your partner. It's okay. I'm not saying it's okay, go do it again. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm saying be okay with it having happened because it was not you who did it. I'm trying to explain that concept to you. And I can't do that. I can't get these words to, get, to go into your mind if you keep on thinking it was I who did it. If you keep on thinking that I can't do it. No, it's like, remember when you were a kid and, you know, they want to get their tops off and right, take the shirt off. And right, if it's a bit tight, and actually if, it's, if, you, if, you have, if you have to button it and they don't realize that buttons have to come off first, and with the buttons on, you try to take off a shirt, and kids, they don't understand this stuff. So like they take off a t-shirt, they try to take off a shirt. And what happens then? It gets stuck up here, right? Then you can't, you, because that is not how a t-shirt is supposed to be taken off. You have to first undo the buttons or unbutton it, right? So what do, you, what do you do then? If someone tries to take the shirt off and they have, without having undone the button, you say, wait, 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 put that, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Put the shirt back on. Just, you know, put it down back, put it back down. They say, first take off that button, the collar button. Yes, that one, undo it first. Now the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So if it has five buttons, and you, once you've undone the five buttons, is it, do you need any longer again to give them instruction on how to take the turf, t shirt off? No, it's already come off. It's already come off. Now all you have to do is just give yourself a bit of a, a shuffle and then the shirt comes off just very naturally. But first you need to realize it's, you know, this is the way it is. Right? This is how I come. This is the package that I come in. These are the defilements that I come with. And it's okay. So, you know, whether you've cheated at an exam or, you know, you got that promotion by... You know, licking someone, you know, doing some boot licking. That's how you got the promotion. Maybe you, you had that extra affair that, you know, you shouldn't have. Maybe you lied to someone. Maybe you lied to someone and it's a terrible lie. Maybe you stole something from somebody. Like I did. Did I tell you the story? Of the cassette recorder? Hmm? I did, yes. Maybe not here. Rajagiri? You should come to Rajagiri Sana. If you think this is good, you should try the Rajagiri Sana. You should just need to learn to be okay. If you feel that you are better than everybody else, first be okay with that. And come to your senses that this is a feeling. This is simply a thought. You know, these there are thoughts like this. It's a very different interpretation to I feel like this. Right? This is also a thought, not my thought. It is not that I am thinking. 
thinking happens. This thought is thought. One is the noun, the other is the verb. Right? This thought is thought. Not, I'm thinking this thought. The moment you do that, you, 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 you go into this cave and you cover yourself up with these defilements and then you can't come out of it because that is part of now, now part of your identity. So maybe, you know, there are things you like to eat. I mean, maybe, you know, your favorite food is what? What taka? Right? Pumpkin. So when you walk up to the Pindapada, right, and then there's what taka. Like, you, sorry, not what taka, pumpkin. Right? And you see, it, you, you feel the, the nice smell, and, you know, now your mouth starts salivating. Right? And then there, there are people waiting to serve you, and now you are a Sri Lasravika. Right? And then people are wondering, they're looking at you. Uh, this this holy figure, uh, this great woman, she's walking up with her arms bowed in her hand. And then you, you are, you are, you are, you are aware that people are watching you and now there's saliva in your mouth. And what do you do? <coughs> Just a cough. <laughs> yeah. You know what? If your mouth is full of saliva, just swallow it. Be okay with that. It's okay. So what if people think you're greedy? Let them. Why, why pretend to be an arahant? That is the toughest role to play. If you pretend to be an arahant, soon, before long, you will go mad. You will. You know, you're on the verge of insanity if you try to pretend to be an arahant. Don't pretend to be an arahant because an arahant is someone who doesn't pretend to be anybody. How do you how do you how do you pretend to be someone? How do you play the role of an actor who has no script? Hmm? You can play the script of uh, you know Romeo. You can play Juliet because they both come with scripts. So there are dialogues that they have to say at certain times. There are play there are ways in which they have to stand right or sit or walk because they come with a script. But what if someone comes with no script? Now how do you play that part? Then. You know, you, you develop your own script and you think this is probably what they're like. But you will always get it wrong because an arahant is nature. There is no script. It is nature, just nature. So don't pretend to be an arahant, just be yourself. It's okay because we accept that. We embrace people of all types of defilements. It matters not what your past is. What matters is, are you learning to be okay with that past? You know, have you not read these stories where the Buddha talks about the things he'd, he'd done in his past? Like when he was a bodhisattva, right? Maybe in the previous birth where he said, you know, I was an animal in one birth. I was a monkey in one birth. I was a cow in another birth. Right? I was an elephant in this birth. Right? You know, see how, how freely he's able to speak of the things that he did, he did in the past. And he'll say, I became a monkey because I did this. Right? I, I went on to become a beast because I did this. He says, he just speaks fact. This is all fact. But he never feels that this was I, it was I who was like that. In the same vein, he'll say, you know, I am the greatest human being. There is no one better than me. There is no one more holy than me. Right? I am the victorious one. I am the undefeated one. I am the omniscient one. No, you think he's boasting? Do you think he's bragging? No, he's not. He's just stating fact. He's just stating fact. This is fact. It's not, you know, it's, he, he, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about Buddha. That's what, that is what he's talking about. He's talking about a state of mind. And rightfully so. Because he's giving an idol. Right? So that people can have something to, to live up to. He's giving you a, a role model so you, can, so you can live up to that. That's what he's doing. So, you know, so as the Buddha, he had no problem talking about who he is today as a Buddha 
as well as the things that he used to do in the past as a bodhisattva, maybe even before he decided to become a bodhisattva. Sometimes the terrible things he might have done. And the Buddha says, you know, I have a backache, an uncurable backache, an uncurable headache because of some of the things I did in the past. He doesn't regret. He just states fact. So if we want to walk the path to Nibbana, as our forefathers did, as our great master did, if we are following in his footsteps, folks, I need all of you to be okay with whoever you are, as you are, right now. When memories will come to haunt you from the past, let the memory come. Let it not haunt you, though. If it haunts you, there's a specter. There's a ghost. Kill the ghost. Let the memory come. Not the ghost. That ghost is your, the ghost that is the self. You think you did it. So you know, you, there will be times when you're listening to the sermons, when you're contemplating, reflecting, like listening to the virtues of the great Arahants, right? Listening to Guru Hanuman talk about Vasalagati and so on. There'll be times where you'll think, I did this, I did that, and so on. And they'll keep coming back to you. Maybe while you're doing the walking meditation, right? You know, things will come back to you. Maybe times where you've been dishonest. Maybe where at times when you've been, uh, you know, uh, you've been adulterer. These things will come back to you. And that's okay. But when they do, try to take just the memory, not the ghost. If the memory comes back to you, that's fine. Like you cheated on your husband. Just to say, right? you cheated. The memory will come back to you. Don't let the ghost come back to you. So don't try to rid your mind of those past memories. That is not the, the purpose of Buddhism. We are not trying to forget the past. That is not what Buddhists do. We don't try and forget the past. We are okay with the past. That's what we're supposed to do. We are not trying to kill the past. We are trying to kill the you from the past. Let the past be. So that, you know, one day you can talk to someone who's in a similar predicament. You can say, Buddha, right? Don't worry. I haven't seen the same problem. I had the same issue. Today you come and tell me that you've been unfaithful to your wife. I had the same problem. Be all right with that. But understand why this unfaithfulness consumed you. Why it happened. Think about the defilements that were in the mind back then, not in your mind, just in the mind. What were those causes that led to that result? Those actions would have their consequences. Perhaps you will never be trusted by anyone in the future. But even if that happens, to realize that it is not happening to you, it's just cause and effect. See, when you can start to think in these terms, folks, right? thoughts will flood through your mind, they'll come and go, but you will just be like a still lake, unbothered. So don't let the memories of your past haunt you. All the plans for your future put fear into your minds. You, know, you have an interview coming up tomorrow. Hmm? Let's say you have an interview, a job interview. If, you know, if the job interview is tomorrow, why are you worried today? <laughs> Think about it. You, 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 we've all been there, haven't we? we all, we've all been there. We know what that feels like. Right? You feel like your, your heart is, is trying to jump out of your mouth. Uh, you're waiting there in the waiting room. Right? Then three people ahead of you. Right? They say, next. Hmm? And you feel really nervous about it. Right? You can almost feel, you feel your heart pounding like a sledgehammer. Hmm? <laughs> See, fear. Is this mind, which is now in a deep state of fear, going to be facing the interview? Is it this mind? No. Right? If we are here, the interview is in another two hours' time. Right? So what are, why are you, <laughs> what are you fretting? What are you worried about? You are not even going to sit an interview. It's not you who is going to be taking the interview. If you have an exam coming up, you know, it's not you who is going to be taking the exam. But two days before the exam, remember how you felt? Why? Because you feel you're the one who has to take the exam. 
you suffer. I mean, you know, let's say they, the exam gets cancelled, right? Or the the, uh, the the job posting gets cancelled. Now, you know, what was the whole point of you worrying about it and fearing about it? What was the whole point? It was, you know, to no avail, right? It was in vain. But you can't help yourself. So this is the answer to all these problems. You know, we talked, I was thinking about, like, we talked about depression a while ago, right? When people feel depressed, right? And, and depression takes over. So feeling depressed and depression are very different things, apparently. So, but however, right? When depression takes over, again, you know, I believe that this is when the mind thinks that these events that happen around, right? Events that come, the comes, the comings and the goings, right? The Rupa, the Vedana, the Sanya, Sankara, and the Vinya. These are all the events that go on. Right? They're all they're all happening to me. And when they're happening to me, when, they, when this feeling of these things happen to me comes in your mind now, you feel like you've been beaten down by, by all the events that, that take place. You feel like, you know, you're the victim. This is this victim mindset. There's only one way to get out of this. And that is to understand the Four Noble Truths. There's no other way. You need to come to awareness of jati. Identify jati. Calling, you know, just referring to Buddhism as the solution for suffering is not going to do because people think suffering is the everyday suffering. It's the felt suffering. This is not the suffering we're talking about. We're talking about jati. But bring your awareness. So this is what mindful awareness is. From where I'm standing, that's where what sort of mindful awareness is. Bring your awareness mindfully to the fact that this is jati. Like when you sit down under this coconut tree and you look up and you see the coconut. Actually, you never see the coconut. Either you're looking down or away from it, or if you look up, there's no coconut because it vanishes. Right? So you'll never see the coconut. In the same way, when you look at jati, there's no jati. It disappears. Jati is suppressed. It becomes latent. So, and the more you keep doing that, the more you're in wisdom, the mind is in a state of wisdom, and that wisdom continues to cleanse the mind eventually until jati has no, has no roots. That's why, you know, when the mind, so there are three stages of cleansing, right? So you have the, uh, the three stages of defiling, and therefore the three stages of cleansing, you have the ditti vipalyasa, sanya vipalyasa, and chitta vipalyasa. Right, so this is like a, a distortion, a distortion of, drish, of drushti, meaning your view. Right? If you think that this is self, if in your views you hold that I am me, okay, then your, your view is distorted. Until, until your view is corrected, there is nothing you can do. So at the stage of becoming a sotapanna, your view is corrected. Your view is rectified. Then you recognize that this is not me, this is just jati. Yeah, you identify that. And then sanya. Sanya is like the scrub that you use to clean. Um, it's like, a, say, if you have a rusty iron, a rusty surface, and you get some scrub, you get a scrub and, 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 and scrub it. Okay? So the first thing you need to do is to identify that it is rusty. This is not the iron, it's just the rust on the iron. First, you need to identify that, right? Because if you don't understand that this is rust on an iron, why would you bother cleaning it? Why would you bother scrubbing it? Yeah? So once you understand that this is just rust on an iron, now what you do is you get hold of a scrub. Now, using that scrub, you continue to, to, to de-rust the iron. And as you keep scrubbing it, gradually, the rust comes off. So the more it comes off, then the more the, the, the pure iron, right, the rust-free iron, you begin to see that and it surfaces. This is the chitta, absolutely. So if you're, if coming to awareness that the iron is rusted is your drushti, right, so you go from a distorted view to a rectified view, and then if the scrub is your sanya, which is the understanding, with understanding that this is rust I need to take out, not the iron. So you can't rid the iron, you have to keep the iron, but just get rid of the rust. 
Right? That is why, you know, some schools of thinking and, and Buddhist philosophy, <clears throat> they talk about ridding the mind entirely. This is not what we are talking about here. We are not talking about shutting down the mind. We are, that's why I say, you know, it's not about re being remembered of past events. Don't try to stop that from happening. If you try to stop rem remembering past events, you're doing the wrong thing. Okay, in a sermon you think, you know, I did this, I did that. Why do these thoughts keep coming to me? Sometimes you ask such questions. I used to like watching films and the things that I used to watch come into my mind. How do I stop that? One day one Anagarika Putta came and asked me, so I mean, I said, I used to watch these films and, you know, naughty films, right? And, and they, they keep coming back to my mind. What should I do? I said, Putta, don't you worry. Because sometimes what I do is I try and remember them. <laughs> I try hard to remind myself of them and see whether it has an effect on me today. So you're trying to rem you're trying to forget them. I am trying to remember them <laughs> to see whether it has an effect on me, whether it burns me up, whether it ignites it ignites the fire of desire within me. And I, and unfortunately, I can't remember much of it. <laughs> Maybe if you remember, tell me of you. <laughs> See, the whole point is, it's not to try and forget the past. It's not that. How can you? Because, you know, thoughts that come into the mind are vipaka. To win this game, you have to accept defeat. Does that make sense? The way to win this game is to accept defeat. There's only one game like that. When thoughts come into your mind, don't try to fight them. Accept them. If you keep fighting them, you're trying to win. You will forever lose because Vipaka is greater. It's, a, it's the greatest force, the force of Vipaka. You can't fight it. You can't fight it and win. You have to accept it. You can accept it gracefully. You can accept it wholeheartedly. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do here. It's to give up our fight with Vipaka. If Vipaka is God, then this is what we are. We are trying to succumb to God. We accept God. That is what we are about. Not to fight it. So, you know, the, your, your mind will sometimes be flooded with various various thoughts of your, from your past, right? You know, things you've done, things you, those at a, at a time you regretted. Maybe you hit someone. Maybe you shouted someone. Maybe you ruined someone's life. You don't do it today, but it happened. Maybe you broke someone's trust in you. And someone really trusted you, really, really, really trusted you. They trusted you with their life, they trusted you with their wife. But you broke their trust. Those thoughts may come back to you from time to time. What I want you to do is not to be someone who tries to forget all that. What I want you to do is to be able to, with a calm, peaceful mind, right? Without a bother, without any frustration or disappointment, right? Just so peacefully, tranquil, you should be able to say, you know, something happened two years ago. My best friend. He left his sister with me. And then this thing happened. We are not in the business of hating the sinner. <laughs> so don't hate yourself. We only hate the sin. But we love the sinner. If you can come to terms with this, I, I don't know how much of what I'm saying makes sense to you, ladies and gentlemen, but if you can, right, you will free yourself up from all this this burden of regret. And you will pick the right battle. Sometimes you pick the wrong battles. And if you're picking the wrong battle, no matter how much you win, you're never going to win. You're not, never going to truly win. That's why I say, 
in our game, in the game of the sasana, victory is accepting defeat. You surrender to God. You surrender to Vipaka. Accept Vipaka. Vipaka, you know what? I accept you. Come as you may. Whatever shape, size you come in, I accept you. Whatever rupa comes my way, I accept it. Whatever Vedana comes my way, I accept it. Sanya, Sankara and Vinyana, whatever comes my way, I accept it. I have no fight with you. I have no battle with you. See, you become part of nature. You become nature. Because nature is Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana. But as long as you keep holding back like this, pushing back, right? Now, whenever something comes and hits, see, it hurts. When I, when I do this, which, which arm do you think hurts? The right or the left? Hmm? Which one? It is the left. It hurts here a lot. See, every time I do that, it hurts. This arm doesn't hurt a bit. Because where's the resistance? Yeah. So your task is not to resist. Your task is to accept. And Ahant accepts. There he accepts what is given. And there's only one thing you need to do to be able to get to that mindset. Recognize that events are events. They're just events. They're not my events. Free yourself from this personalizing, personal identification, this internalizing of events. And you just see events as events. That's it. Kill the manager. Let the event happen. Don't be event managers. (laughs) Just let the event happen. Let the event take place. Even when you are thinking, don't think that it is you who is thinking. Thinking happens. When you listen to the sermon, right? try to get out of this mindset that it is I who is listening to the sermon. The sermon is being listened to. Passive. A sermon is being preached and a sermon is being listened to. So is it you who is understanding it then? No, it is being understood. But, you know, not just at you know not just superficially these are not just uh, just some words that you need to try and get your thinking around i am talking about a comprehension right you need to realize this and to realize it what you need to do is to realize that this is jati when jati takes place right when jati takes place then you cannot stop yourself you cannot stop the mind from identifying with all these events that take place around you Today, if you, can, if you can't see your mother as a mother, that is because of jati. If you can't see your child as a child, that is because of jati. If you can't see father as a father, that is because of jati. You think that is your father. And that's how people become your friends and your enemies. But it is not so. If you can't see this pen as just a pen, see this pen is actually, this is an arahant. I don't know whether you believe me or not. This is an arahant. I'll tell you why this is why I believe this is an arahant. Right? It's because, folks, you know, this pen will write no matter who writes with it. Agree? Yeah. Anyone who has the capability to remove this, take this lid off and write with it, it will write for them. So this pen will render to society whatever this pen can. It doesn't keep anything back for itself. And besides, it doesn't write better for some people and write less for others. Does it? No. Anyone in this room who would pick up this pen at this moment will be able to write the same. Whatever this pen can do, it can do it for all of you. If you can use this pen as a paperweight, If I can, so can you all. If I can write with it, so can you all. If I can throw it up in the air and catch it, so can you all. Right? So this pen, whatever whatever characteristics this pen this pen holds, whatever behaviors and attributes that this pen demonstrates, it will do that for all of you, just like an arahant. An arahant is an arahant to everybody. But are you? When are you an arahant? I'll tell you when you're an arahant, when you're among your friends. Hmm? When you're among people you like, you're an arahant. 
aren't you? You're so kind, so generous, so gentle, so thoughtful. When you're among your family, oh, you're another half. But what about when you're amongst people you don't like? Hmm? Then where's the other half? <laughs> See? You have preferences. You have likes and dislikes. So you can't render yourself fully in the service of mankind. There are people who you will give yourself entirely, and then there are those who you won't give yourself entirely. Hmm? Just think about how things happen in, like in, the, in, work, in the workplace, like in, sometimes in offices and so on. Right? When you go to get something done, right, you got to be in the good books, right? What about, what if you fall out with them? Hmm? If they don't like you, they can make life difficult for you, can't they? And this is what we call politics. Yeah, workplace politics. Right? Sometimes, you know, if, if someone really likes you, then they'll get the job done for you. Otherwise, you know, red tape everywhere. They can't do this because of this. Can't do that because of that. But if they like you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we can, you know, laws are made to be broken. <laughs> they'll say. And they'll get it done for you, see? So, you know, you, you just think about yourself as a human being. If you are a mother... You are only truly, well and truly a mother to your own child. That's why another child doesn't sense that motherliness from you. That's why Anagarika Mahatmyas are different. Because they're not anyone's mother. They're everyone's mother. Speak to the children at Noble Hearts and ask them. They're not mother to one person. They're mother to everybody. Anyone who wishes to. Anyone who seeks mother from me, right? I am I am willing to give it to them. That is where I want you all to be. If anyone seeks a friend, you be that one. If anyone seeks a friend, anyone seeks a friend, I am I'm prepared. I'm ready to be their friend. When you don't have preferences, when you don't have choices that you want to make, when you don't have likes and dislikes, now you can be a friend to anybody. But if there are things that you expect in return, I'll be a friend to you if only you do this for me or you do that for me. If you speak to me nicely. Hmm? Now, you can't be like this pen. Just think about it. If you know, I, I, I care for this pen. I, 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 I clean it. I put the lid back on all the time. Keep it in the pen holder. Right? I really care about this pen. You, madam, don't. You come up here, you take this pen, put it on the, bang it on the floor and pick it up again and bang it on the floor again and take it and step on it. You don't break it, but you still take it, take the lid off and start writing. Won't it write? It will. It will still write. And then if I come and take it from you and start writing, it will write the same way. The pen is not going to turn around and say, I, you, lady, I'm not going to write for you because you, you stepped on me. You threw me around. You didn't treat me well. But for the sign, I say, I'm going to write very well because... He looked after me. See, nothing. I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, an arahant. Huh? Put sari, put the tero to a side for a second. Try and become like this pen. <laughs> Give yourself entirely to those who seek it. Entirely. That's why I said right at the beginning of this talk, it's not about what you know. It's about who you are to others. Whatever you are capable of, if you can fly, fly in the service of mankind. If you can run, run. If you can give blood, give. If you can jump and, you know, if someone wants the moon and you can get it, go bring it to them. Don't have two faces. An arhan doesn't have two faces. They only have one. Friend or foe. In fact, to them there are no friends and there are no foes. Because in you make a friend, you make a foe. They're both friend and foe within you, not within them. That's how today one person can be your friend, the next day they can be your foe. How so? They didn't change, you changed. So don't have two faces. Hmm? One for one the good side, and <laughs> the bad side. You're seeing my good face today. Huh? Today you're seeing my bad face. Don't have two faces. Why wear that mask? Put it aside. Just be yourself. 
And to be yourself, first of all, you need to be okay with yourself. If you are also trying to show two faces to yourself, right, you can't be helped. Because remember, we are trying to get this, this, this shirt over your head. You're trying to get a shirt over your head. That's not how shirts come on and off. You've got to unbutton them. So first, be okay with yourself. Whatever problems you have, right, we understand you come as a package. Okay, we understand that you weren't arahants in your last birth. That's why you've come into this world. So we are okay with that. We understand that. It's okay. See, I'm okay. I came into this world as a human being with all my defilements. Right? Are you not okay with that? And if you're okay with that, then I'm okay with you. Right? So what's the problem? We, you know, we've all sinned. The Buddha's teaching is don't sin. Not don't have sinned. Yeah. Don't sin, meaning don't do it from today. But he doesn't say don't have sinned. If we've not sinned, then what is the purpose of a Buddha? The Buddha's job is to teach us how to get out before the consequences of our actions come to bite us on our backs. He's a trickster, <laughs> the biggest con man. So that is what the Dhamma is for, right? So, last few words for today. These things will happen to you, right? The past will come to you, but don't let it haunt you. The future will come, let, come to you, but don't let that haunt you. Both your past and your future only haunt you if in the present moment you create the ghost of self. So kill that ghost. It is not the past that bothers you and it is not the future that bothers you. It is your perception that past and future are both yours. That's why they say the past haunts. It's not the past that is the problem, but the ghost that haunts. Kill that ghost. Right? So from now on, please, when things come to your mind, when you are reminded of things in the past, right? whatever, however terrible those things might have been, whatever transgressions you have made, be okay with that. Just don't do it again. Why don't do it again? Because again, the consequences will come back to you, right? And you can't, you won't be able to get out of this guilt-based thinking. But the more you do sin, the more this guilt will trap you. That's the way, that's the very nature of it, right? So to break free from that, you got to stop sinning first. Sabbapapa Sakarana has to come first. Right? When Kusala Supasampada comes, right? Now you begin to realize, no, past events, future events, that's it. And present, they're also events, not my events, not happening to me. For that, Sachitta Pariyodapana. Your chitta, begin come to come to your awareness that this is a chitta. This is a chitta. I kill the swear from the chitta. Just recognize that this is just a chitta, not a swear. That's why it's called the Sambuddha Sasuna. Swasuna. You have to destroy this sense of self. Eradicate the sense of self. That is what the Buddha Sasana is for. Then let events be. <laughs> let nature, let nature takes it, take its course and you'll be okay with that. So just like an observer who stands, stands by, the, by, the, by the shore, right? watching the sunset, watching the sunrise, watching the waves crash, crash on, the, on the beach. right? Just observe the, the ships in, you know, sailing afar. The whales jumping up and down. Just watch and observe the, the birds, the seagulls flying in the sky. Just observe. You can really begin to enjoy nature and enjoy its beauty if you just let nature be, be the way it is. But if you, if you, try, to, if you try, if you try to create your own picture of what nature is supposed to be like, now you always be comparing. This is what happens here as well. You compare your present to your past. That's why you feel guilt. You compare your present to your future. That's when you feel fear. It's always this comparison. To compare, you need two things. The event from the past and the, and the present picture. The event from the future and the present picture. Kill the present and you have killed both the past and the future. Make sense? Good. All right. Let's transfer the merits for today and bring today's sermon to a close. 
All right, let us all take a moment then to transfer the merits that we have all acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem, chanting Pirit, listening to the Dhamma, and engaging in various meritorious deeds today. First and foremost, let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching and with immense gratitude towards bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who have since time immemorial protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Sri which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message that we have acquired to all members of the Mahasangha, present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget that amongst them are the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. And let us also transfer this message to my teacher, Guru Swami Mahanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika, Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by chance retreating these talks, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. And by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and, op- and overcoming obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our devotees and friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provided for the construction of the monastery to those who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, and medicines, as well as those who continue to selflessly contribute their know-how and their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits, and by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nimba. So, so, so. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employees and our employees, those who have helped us, supported us and assisted us, our teachers. May they all rejoice in these merits. And by the power of these merits, if any of them, I beg your pardon, May they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and not overcome any obstacles through their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to the devas and brahmas, the spirits and demons, and primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to fulfilling and protecting and preserving the Sambuddha Sasana. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. By the power of these merits, may they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our ancestors, to all those who have predeceased us to, and passed away in our name. May they all rejoice in these merits, reminding ourselves that in this infinite long journey of sansara, they will have shed their blood, sweat and tears on our behalf, and it is in their labor today we reap the fruits of our comforts. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer merits to members of the armed forces, as well as the police force, who sacrifice their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation, as well as those who passed away in the wars, be their friend or foe. Let us, may they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to those who have lost their lives to natural disasters and calamities, such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, blizzards, as well as pandemics that have come and gone. May they all rejoice in these merits. If any of them have been born in the warfare plains, they, redo- they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Finally, by the power and merits of all the, by the power and blessings of all the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we may be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And finally, may you and I and everyone who's helped make this program a success become a Rahatan Mahanse and Arahat Teranin Mahanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. The blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. And the Mahasangha will now transfer the blessings to you. Raga Ginnang Nidatnva 
ನಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖಯನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತಾರಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖಯನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತಾರಿಯಲು ಲೋಕ ಸಿಯಲು ಸತ್ವಯೋ ನಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖಯನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತಾರಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖಯನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತಾರಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖಯನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತಾರ ರಾಗ ಗಿನಿ ದ್ವೇಷ ಗಿನಿ ಮೋಹ ಗಿನಿ ತುಂಡ್ರನ್ಗೆ ಸೂಸಿ ಅನಂತ ಮಹಾಗುಣ ಬೆಲೆನ್ ಸೀರು ಲೋಕ ಸೀರು ಸಾತ್ವ ನಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪಾರಮಿಸುಖೇನ ಸುತ್ತರ ಸಾಧು ಸಾಧು ಸಾಧು